Hey everyone, welcome back. So finally excited to talk about this very cool concept of kernels in SVM. So as I mentioned in the last video on SVM Dual, which by the way, I would highly recommend watching first so you fully understand this. As I mentioned in that video, this idea of kernels in SVM is at the intersection of very, very useful topics in machine learning, but also kind of difficult to understand at first. And for me, I learned kernels like several independent times over the course of the years, and they never really stuck until now. So um, I, I wanna make sure that you don't have that experience and that you understand kernels a lot better from the get-go. So let's start with a motivating example. So let's look at this very simple looking 2D case of two classes of data. So we have the triangles who have relatively low coordinates for x1 and x2. So this is just two dimensional data. And we have the x's which have relatively higher uh, values of x1 and x2. And the question is, can we make a SVM classifier? I'll just say we're using hard SVM for this video, so the hard margin case. Which means that, can we draw a line that's going to perfectly separate the two classes? We stared at it for a second and the answer is no, even though it seems like there's such a natural way to separate the classes. Because the hard margin SVM case just asks, is there a line I can draw? And the answer is no. But let's see if there's something simple we can do using the existing data. And what we will do is add a new feature. So we'll engineer a new feature based on the existing ones. Specifically, that new feature will be x1 squared plus x2 squared. So we take the x coordinate, square it, and add it to the y coordinate also squared. And so we can represent this now as three-dimensional data. So the first two dimensions are the same, nothing different. The third dimension is that new feature we constructed, which again looks like this. And we see looking at this crude picture in three dimensions, it's actually very easy to solve the SVM problem. And the reason is that this new feature has pretty low values for this triangle class because both x1 and x2 are pretty small in absolute value. And these x's have relatively higher values for the new feature, which means that we can cleanly separate our two classes in three dimensions using a plane. And I won't show it here, but actually, very interestingly, a plane in this three-dimensional feature space is actually a circle in this two-dimensional feature space, which is exactly the shape we wanted to separate these two classes. But the main point I want to get across is that Using SVM, sometimes it helps us to project our data into a higher dimensional space. Another way of saying that is it helps to take our original number of variables, which was two, and do some very clever engineering of these variables and add new variables so that the problem becomes easy or trivial in that higher dimensional space. So that is the idea we want to keep in mind. And so mathematically what we did is we took this original data, which just had two numbers in it, the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate, or xi1 and xi2, and we projected it into a higher dimensional space. Now, if we wanted to consider all two-way interactions between these variables, we would have had a vector of length six, so we just had a constant one. We have our original data, xi1 and xi2, and then we consider the three different two-way interactions. So that's xi1, xi2, that's the pure interaction term, and then we have the two pure quadratic terms, and those are the two pure quadratic terms we use to construct this third feature. So we went from a two-dimensional space to a six-dimensional space. And if we wanted to consider all three-way interactions and four-way, our uh, space would just keep growing and growing and growing. And so we can write this compactly, whatever the transformation is, as we take some vector xi from our original data, which looked like this, and we apply some transformation big T, which takes us to a higher dimensional space. So T of xi is the six-dimensional vector, and xi is that original two-dimensional vector. Now, if we think back to that dual formulation SVM video, and this is why I highly recommend watching that, it'll make it much more clear why kernels are so powerful. We said in that dual SVM video that if we represent the SVM problem in its dual form, we only need to care about the inner products between our data. That is, we only care about xi dot xj for all i and j that's in our data. And so, equivalently, now that we've transformed our data using transformation t, we still now only care about the inner products between the transformed data, which is t of xi dot t of xj, again, for all i and j in our original data. And after we've taken these inner products between transformed vectors, we can just run the SVM problem regularly, and then we can get some answer. So the main point of what I just said is that now, after we transform the data, all we care about is actually just the inner products between the transformed vectors. Let's look at this diagram to better understand at a high level what we're doing. So we have our original data, 
And we're trying to get down to this lower right-hand box, which is the transformed inner products. Now, the most straightforward way to do it, especially given everything I've just showed you, is that the first thing we're going to do is run the transformation T to get our transformed data, which is going from this two-dimensional space to the six-dimensional space, for example. And then we simply just take the inner products in order to get to these transformed inner products. Now, can we think of any issues with this approach? So I've put this red exclamation point to kind of draw your attention to this transformation step T. Although in our case, going from two to six variables doesn't seem like a huge deal, you can imagine that as you try to consider more and more interactions, or if you're trying to do more complex interactions, the new size of the space can blow up pretty fast, and that's gonna cause some inefficiencies down the road. For example, at least in terms of data storage, whereas before you had to store two columns, now you have to store who knows how many columns. So this could be rather expensive, both in terms of time and space, to do actually this transformation T and get the transformed data. So now we go back to the drawing board. Is there a different path for us to get from the original data to the transformed inner products? And we actually see there is on this board. We can alternatively go down this path. Let's explore that option and see if there's anything there. Instead of our first step being running the transformation, which could get us a pretty inefficient large matrix in memory, let's instead just get the original inner products of the data. So let me put a couple of dimensions here so we make sure we understand why something's inefficient versus efficient. So the original data would be n by p, n observations and p variables, in our case p was 2. If we did this transformation, we would have n by, I'll put big P, big P just being some large number of dimensions, and that causes the inefficiency. If instead we take the original inner products first, and to be clear, by original inner products, I mean we get all of the xi's dot xj's, so we haven't done any transformations yet. How many of those are there? There's n times n because we basically need to get the inner product of every one of the n vectors with every other one of the n vectors. So this is n squared. That's a 2 right there. Oops. Okay, that's a 2. And then this is the step that's a little bit unclear, but let's say there's some kind of function or some kind of transformation that's going to allow us to go from the original inner products, that is xi dot xj, directly to the transformed inner products, that is t of xi dot t of xj. And the very crucial thing to note is that we are going directly from the original inner products to the transformed inner products and skipping this transformation, this explicit transformation altogether. And so let me just close the story here and say that the transform inner product space is also n squared. Why? Because in transforming the data, we're not adding any new samples. There's still n samples. So there's still going to be n squared transformed inner products. So instead of having to go through this route of getting this very high dimensional matrix living in memory, which could cause inefficiencies, we go down this route, which is much more efficient in certain cases. But of course, this only works, this very much depends on if there is some kind of transformation we can do to get from our original inner products to the transformed inner products. And it doesn't seem clear now, but let's do a little bit of experiments to see if we can get there. So, Let's start from what we want. We want the transformed inner products. That is, we want t of xi dot t of xj. If I were to actually do t of xi dot t of xj, which you can do in this case, because there's only six of them. So you imagine you take a vector that looks like this with the i's, and you dot it, or inner product of that, with the vector that looks like this, except with j's. And let's ask ourselves the question, what sort of terms come out of that operation? And you get these six terms. So this can be a little bit confusing to look at, I admit, because there's subscripts and superscripts floating around. But the main thing you need to keep in mind is that you get these six distinct terms when you explicitly do this transformation. So we ask ourselves the question, is there another way to get these exact six terms, which are going to give us the power of working in a high dimensional space, but without explicitly doing this transformation? Let's consider this magical function I've written up here called k poly 2 of xi dot xj. The first thing, even before I define this function for you, is that it's just a function of the inner products of the original data. Okay, so it's not doing any transformations using this t itself. That's the biggest thing to keep in mind as I talk here. This function is defined as 1 plus xi dot xj squared. And we can actually open that up just a little bit because we know the form of xi dot xj. That would be taking a vector that looks like this and taking the inner product of that with a vector that looks like this except with the j's. And that will give us xi1, xj1 plus xi2, xj2. And of course, we're squaring that after adding that to 1. And I won't actually do the algebra. Of course, it would get a little bit, little bit crazy. Not too bad. But the main question, again, we want to ask is that what are the unique terms 
that come out of doing this operation. And you'll find that it is these six terms. Now I step away from the board for a second here. You compare this list of six terms with that list of six terms, and if you stare at it or pause, you'll find that they are the exact same. And now our gears start turning. Let's backtrack all the logic and think about what this means for our problem. We're able to get these six terms using this operation, which only depends on the inner products of the original data. Now those are the exact six terms, coincidentally, or not coincidentally actually, that we need if we're able to get the transformed inner product, which means we're able to go about it this way or this way. Now the benefit of going about it this way again is that we never actually have to run the transformation T. We never have to send our data to a high dimensional space, but we reap all of the benefits of sending our data to the high dimensional space. Looking at our diagram again, if it's still a little bit confusing, I don't blame you because this took me years to grasp. We go from our original data and we take the original data's inner products. So we have a bunch of terms that look like xi.xj. And then we go ahead and run this new function, which now I call k, k for kernel. So this is the first time I'm calling it a kernel function. We run the kernel function of the original inner products, and we get the same terms as we would have if we explicitly took the transformed inner products themselves. If it sounds a little bit crazy or magical, I agree. I still think it's crazy or magical, but hopefully you see why it works and how it works here. And why it's important is, again, we avoid ever sending our data to this high dimensional space, but we still get all of the benefits. And so the final thing I'll say in this video is again that this is called a kernel function. And in general, a kernel function is, in the context of SVM at least, is any function that only uses the inner products of the original data and is able to use those inner products and send them or do some kind of operation to send them to the inner products of the transform data. Again, without ever visiting the transform space itself. So I hope that this gave you a good idea about why kernels work, how kernels work, why they're important in the context of SVM. Um, any comments are, of course, welcome below. If you like this video, please like and subscribe for more just like this, and I will see you next time.